Chapter 5 Killing Cycle Call of the Wild Circus of Power In the late 1980s, when overproduced hair metal dominated MTV's programming, Circus of Power were an anomaly. Fusing elements of classic southern rock, blues, and punk with heavy metal style production and authentic, grimy New York City aesthetics, they were a mangy, snarling mongrel next to a pack of primping poodles. But their songwriting was inconsistent, and as their relatively short career progressed, the band's music videos began to suffer from some of the cliches of cheesy plots and video models. But on Circus of Power's self-titled 1988 debut album, they caught lightning in a bottle. Call of the Wild and In the Wind were damn near rock and roll perfection. It was everything I wanted. During my senior year in high school, my band Killing Cycle was in full swing. Williamsburg didn't provide us with a lot of options to play shows, but we tried our best to make up for it. We begged club owners in nearby cities to let us sneak in and play despite being underaged. We played high school band competitions, house parties, and even rented community centers. We played anywhere and everywhere as often as we could. In the summer of 1990, shortly after I graduated high school, I went with some of my bandmates to see Faith No More and Circuits of Power at the Boathouse in Norfolk, Virginia. After Circus of Power set, their guitarist, Gary Sunshine, was hanging out at the soundboard. Thrilled at the chance to speak to one of my heroes, I nervously approached Gary and told him how great I thought their set was. I also told him that my band covered Call of the Wild and In the Wind. He was genuinely surprised and told me how cool it was to hear that younger bands were playing Circus of Power songs. He was stoked. I was too. Over three decades later, while writing this book, I found Gary Sunshine's account on a social media app. I messaged him and told him how I'd approached him at that show so long ago. Gary wrote me back, and to my surprise, he remembered our encounter. I'm still a fan. As my 10th grade year ended and the summer of 1988 began, I faced a harsh reality. The most important thing in my life was coming to an end. Axis was breaking up. Lance and Brian were both going away to college, while Chris, Ryan, and I were still in high school. Their colleges were far away, so getting together to practice wasn't realistic. For a little while, we tried to ignore the inevitable, playing parties that summer and talking optimistically about continuing to jam during their semester breaks. But that all faded away as soon as the guys left for school. The band was finished, and it was time to move on. This put Chris and me back at square one, with one difference. We were an established team now but we needed to rebuild. Around this time, I was introduced to a newcomer to our town. John Peters had recently moved with his family from Houston to Williamsburg. Standing in the parking lot of an apartment complex where a party had outgrown the building and spilled outside, John and I bonded over our shared love of classic muscle cars and heavy music. We both owned early 70s Chevy Chevelles and loved thrash metal music. How I got my Chevelle is a story in itself. Earlier that year, while riding with some friends down a narrow country road in Julie Watson's 1984 Dodge Colt on the way to a cornfield party, we rounded a sharp left curve and into the path of a speeding pickup truck. Julie swerved in a panic, jerking the steering wheel hard to the right. The car careened off the road and into a large cedar tree. I was in the passenger seat without a seatbelt. People didn't wear seatbelts then like they do now, especially teenagers, because it wasn't cool. But face planting into a car windshield isn't cool either. I remember almost nothing of the actual accident. Upon impact, I was hurled forward and upward into the dashboard and windshield of the car. The force of my head and body pushed out the passenger side of the windshield and bent the dash. I landed sideways on the floorboard of the car with my head at Julie's feet and my legs in the passenger side floorboard. Julie's shirt and most of the front seat were splattered with blood from where the windshield had sliced my forehead. My friend Jeff, who had been riding in the back seat and had broken his leg in the crash, later told me that when they climbed out of the car to wait for an ambulance, he thought I might be dead. After the crash, I woke up with a horrible headache, made even more painful by the roaring sound of some kind of engine. That noise I later learned was the jaws of death they used to cut the door off the car to get me out. Opening my eyes, I couldn't see anything because of all the blood that had run down from my forehead into my eyes. I heard the welcome
welcome sound of an EMT telling me that I had been in a car accident and that I was going to be okay. She was a calming presence in a terrifying situation, and everything she told me turned out to be true. I ended up with a concussion, a stitched up forehead, a broken toe, and a body full of bumps and bruises. The following week, a representative from Julie's insurance company showed up at our house with a check for $1,500 to help compensate for any inconveniences that might arise from my injuries. My parents interpreted this as being, please don't sue money. Not too long after that, I used that same exact $1,500 to buy my first car, a faded blue 1972 Chevy Chevelle with Krager SS mag wheels and dual exhaust. Standing in a light rain in the parking lot of that apartment complex, John and I made small talk about our Chevelles and drank cheap keg beer out of plastic cups. I'd been starting to drink more regularly, usually keeping an ear out for parties on the weekends. There were almost always a couple of options. Drinking was fun. I liked the buzz. When I drank, I felt loose and comfortable. It made me happy. My anxiety lifted and I relaxed. I also felt cooler when I drank and everyone did it, so it seemed normal. John and I discussed the merits of our shabby hot rods. His was faster, but mine looked better. As we talked, we discovered that not only were we both proud Chevelle owners, but we also liked many of the same bands. John's favorite Slayer album was Rain and Blood. Mine was South of Heaven. He had a fake ID, which meant that he could buy alcohol. And to make a cool situation even cooler, John played bass. He had some decent gear and was looking to join a band. This was perfect. With John on bass, all we needed was a drummer for our new band. Word had spread quickly around our tiny music scene that Chris and I were looking to start a new band. Some friends suggested that we check out another relatively recent transplant named Joey Huertes. Joey grew up in New York City in a blue-collar Bronx neighborhood. His family had moved to Williamsburg just a couple of years earlier, and he finished his last two years of high school across town at Bruton High. We initially spoke by phone and discussed our goals. We were both serious about putting a real band together. I could tell by talking to him that he was a good drummer and that he had confidence. When Joey and I first met in his small garage practice space to play together, I was a bit overwhelmed. He was a tornado of energy and unrestrained creativity. He talked as fast as he could think and had a new idea every other minute. He was loud and opinionated, sometimes even a bit overbearing. His New York mannerisms felt brash to my much slower small town Virginia sensibility. But I liked him. He was funny with a morbid and bizarre sense of humor. Most important, Joey was a good drummer, easily the best metal drummer in our town. I was surprised I hadn't heard about him any sooner. After a couple of exploratory jam sessions in his garage during which Joey and I auditioned each other, it was clear we were a great fit. We both had solid groove and lots of ideas, and we were ambitious and excited. When John, Joey, and I played together, the chemistry was there. It felt like we'd been a band for years. We intuitively understood each other's musical style. We improvised together in free-form jams that often ended up sounding rehearsed. We were locked into each other's playing, simultaneously anticipating the next change and predicting the next freestyled riff. It was thrilling. I'd never felt such a connection to other musicians. Chris watched it all happening and was just as ecstatic. We dove headfirst into rehearsing and learning songs for our new band, which we called Killing Cycle. We held band practices every Friday night in Chris's large walkout basement recreation room. We moved in and took up the entire room. Joey's drum set was massive. A shiny, black, Pearl brand kit with double kick drums and cymbals anywhere he could fit one. John's job detailing cars at a local Honda dealership allowed him just enough financial independence to secure a loan for a new Ampeg SVT bass amp and a powerful matching speaker cabinet. Chris had saved up enough money to buy an old beat up PA system from the 1970s. It still worked well and was loud enough for him to be heard over the rest of us. I still had the same gear I'd been using since before I joined Axis. My white Kramer Focus 2000 guitar and a 50-watt Marshall JCM-800 plugged into a Sonic 412 cabinet with Celestian speakers. Unlike damaged band practices at Chopper Dale's house, 
Killing cycle practices had no party atmosphere. While getting drunk was becoming increasingly common for most of my bandmates and me, except for Joey, who rarely drank and didn't do any drugs. We only did it after rehearsals. We were focused as we put together a set of cover songs. We kept some of the songs that Chris and I had been playing in Damage, including the two Circus of Power songs, along with Love Removal Machine and King Contrary Man by The Cult. We added Bloodbath in Paradise by Ozzy Osbourne, which was great fun for me because the song features blistering guitar work by Zach Wilde. We worked up our own heavy interpretation of Billy Idol's White Wedding, and we played versions of Nobody's Fault and Time that were far closer to the much heavier Testament and Wrathchild America versions than they were to the Aerosmith and Pink Floyd originals. The big difference between Killing Cycle and my previous bands was that we also wrote our own material. I had been experimenting with songwriting since my early days in Axis, but by the time Killing Cycle was formed, I was writing my own riffs. We were all becoming adept at arranging and structuring songs. Bolstering our songwriting efforts were lyrical contributions from Joey and Chris. Joey was an active lyricist with notebooks of stories and off-the-wall lyrics rooted in his dark sense of humor. Our song Apology Accepted explored the guilt, shame, and remorse of running over the neighbor's dog. I never asked Joey if he wrote that from personal experience. Deep Freeze was the imaginary story of a terminally ill patient who is cryogenically frozen, hoping that he can be thawed and cured once medical technology can treat his disease. Landslide Suicide was an anti-drug song loosely inspired by a family friend of Joey's who died of an overdose. Chris wrote the lyrics for Eye of the Storm. Taking a less narrative approach than Joey's contributions, Chris opted for more abstract and pending doom themes arranged over my Led Zeppelin immigrant song influenced musical composition. In short time, Killing Cycle had pieced together a strong repertoire of covers and a handful of original songs. Once we got comfortable playing together, our practices loosened up and friends came by to listen. After band practice, we'd usually head out to a party or find a way to make one. I was beginning to drink regularly on the weekends. Miller beer, Everclear grain alcohol, and Jack Daniels were mainstays. Drinking made me feel relaxed and confident. I could finally talk to girls without second guessing every word. And they even talked back. Plus, teenage growth spurts and a lot of self-imposed meal skipping had left me much thinner. I was no longer the fat kid. My dad had also finally relented and stopped forcing me to get my hair cut. It was longer and shaggy now hanging well past my shoulders. I wore ripped jeans and heavy metal concert t-shirts with a black leather jacket. I finally felt cool. Partying felt to me like it was part of that metamorphosis. It was a component of my new identity, but the band was still my priority. As good as we were, Killing Cycle faced the obstacle of being stuck in our dead end town. There weren't a lot of places to play, Taking a cue from the time Chris and I had spent in Axis, we put on our own show at the local recreation center. We entered local band competitions, winning first place at the Lafayette High School Battle of the Bands. We also entered the famed Stockwood competition at Bruton High that Axis had won a couple years earlier and were shocked when we did not win. We laughed it off. We knew we were the best band that night. We also knew we had to think bigger than high school band competitions. It was time to go after some real gigs. About an hour's drive from us in the Norfolk and Virginia Beach area, there was a small but active metal club scene. Popular local bands played the circuit all week long. Traveling regional acts came through to headline on the weekends, often playing with smaller local openers. We were dying to be a part of it. We knew that if we wanted to play in clubs, we needed a proper demo tape to submit to the talent bookers. Fortunately, I'd become acquainted with Ronnie, the owner and studio engineer of Fresh Tracks Recording Studio, when I took guitar lessons there a few years earlier. Ronnie remembered me when I stopped by, and he kindly gave us a discounted rate on some studio time to record our demo. Killing Cycle's recording sessions at Fresh Tracks were like nothing I had done before. They were serious and professional. The small strip mall studio was divided into three sections. There was a live room, just big enough for John, Joey, and me to set up and record the basic rhythm tracks. In the corner of the main room was a small soundproof booth where Chris sang his isolated vocal takes. 
On the other side of the live room was a large glass window looking into a long, narrow control room where Ronnie worked at the 16-channel mixing board. Next to the board was a large reel-to-reel tape machine loaded with two-inch tape to record the sessions. The studio walls were covered with acoustical tiles, foam soundproofing, and cedar wood panels. It was a modest, low-budget recording studio, but to us, it might as well have been the most modern, cutting-edge facility in Hollywood. We were all well-rehearsed and worked efficiently to make good use of our studio time. Ronnie was patient and attentive, educating us about basic recording techniques. He gave us honest critiques of our performances to help us get the best takes possible onto tape. I had already gained some rudimentary experience in multi-track recording with the four-track cassette recorder I'd used to make practice demos. But recording at Fresh Tracks was a whole new level. Its 16 separate tracks opened possibilities for adding extra layers of guitars, overdubbed solos, harmonies, and background vocals. If I could hear it in my head, I could try it in the recording. If I didn't like the sound of something, I could do it again. I knew as soon as we started that the studio was where I felt most at home. It still is, and that's because recording is still my favorite part of my job. We recorded four original songs that Ronnie mixed down to a cassette tape that we could copy. We wrote a short band bio, printed it out with a list of all our songs, and submitted it along with our demo tape to clubs. They must have liked it because we started getting offers to play shows, but they were very entry level. Most of the invitations made clear that we would not be paid. As a new band on the club circuit, we had to start by playing short sets for no money and opening up for other bands. But we knew if we went over well, we could move up the ranks. We'd caught our big break and were finally turning pro. Or at least that's how I saw it. One club was particularly exciting to me. On stage was a dingy metal club nestled among used car dealerships and pawn shops that lined a shabby commercial avenue in downtown Virginia Beach. Miles away from the scenic, tourist-dominated oceanfront area, on stage catered to young, heavy metal-loving military personnel stationed at several nearby bases. Of all the clubs on the circuit, on stage booked the most traveling bands, and even sometimes featured up-and-coming national touring acts. The club manager was a tall, barrel-shaped guy named Bear, who was likely in his mid-thirties, but who looked much older. He always looked like he'd just woken up in the same clothes from the night before, which may have been true. Bear was in charge of everything at Onstage, including booking and scheduling bands. Joey had made the 45-minute drive to the club to drop off our demo tape and bio a few weeks earlier. Bear liked what he heard. He offered us an unpaid time slot on a Wednesday night opening up for local circuit stalwarts Jinx. We were thrilled. As far as we were concerned, We might as well have been opening for Iron Maiden at Madison Square Garden. This was the biggest thing any of us had ever done musically. But there was one small problem. Our rock star breakthrough moment was on a school night. I nervously pled my case to my parents, explaining what a huge opportunity this was. I pointed out that I'd been keeping my grades up, and I promised to come straight back home as soon as we were finished and had our gear packed. Because they had always supported my musical ambition, They let me play. My dad didn't have much to say. He listened, thought for a minute, then nodded his head and said okay. Chris got a green light from his folks as well. Killing Cycle was going to play a real club. The afternoon of the show, we met up as soon as Chris and I got out of school. We were nervous. We piled as much of our gear as we could into Joey's Chevy Chevelle and John's recently acquired Honda Prelude. The engine in his Chevelle had died not long before. The club would provide some in-house speaker cabinets we could use to plug our amps into. When we arrived at the club, we parked by the back loading door and started unpacking our gear. John's anxiety got the best of him. He staggered over to a nearby dumpster and threw up next to it. Dude, I don't know if I can do this, he said to me, eyes red and watering from having just vomited. I'm nervous too, man, I confess, but we're here. We worked hard for this. Don't worry. We're going to be great. I wasn't sure if I believed we were actually going to be great. It just seemed like something I was supposed to say. Once we got our gear inside and stacked next to the small stage, we walked over to the club office in the front corner of the building and introduced ourselves to Bear. Hey, Bear, we're Killing Cycle from Williamsburg. Thanks for giving us a slot, Joey said, trying to sound cool and not overly excited. Uh, 
yeah, nice to meet you guys. Glad you could make it, Bear replied uneasily. He looked us over one at a time, eyes returning to Chris and me. How old are you two, Bear asked suspiciously. I'm 16, Chris answered nonchalantly. I'm 17, I followed. Bear stared at us blankly. On stage was a nightclub that served alcohol. We were too young to be in the building without a legal guardian. None of us had thought about this before, and Bear hadn't thought to ask. Evidently, he didn't get a lot of high school kids auditioning to play his club. Y'all are just fucking kids, Bear groused. I could get in a lot of trouble for this. Bear nervously scratched at the balding spot on the top of his head and gazed up at the grimy drop ceiling tiles deep in thought. Okay, he barked. Here's the fucking deal. You two will sit right here, he said sternly to Chris and me, motioning to a small table just outside his office door. When you're not on stage playing your set, your asses will be right fucking here at this table where I can keep my eye on you. The other two can get your gear out of here as soon as y'all are done playing, understand? We understood. Bear was taking a real risk letting us play. We were grateful for the opportunity and followed his instructions. Chris and I stayed at our assigned table and drank free sodas until it was time for us to go on. It was a Wednesday night and we were opening for a local act, so there wasn't much of a crowd. But we played as if it were a packed house. Joey twirled his drumsticks high above his head in between snare hits while his feet hammered out rhythms on his kick drums. John lunged back and forth to the rhythm in the widest stance he could hold, bass slung low, down to his knees. Chris confidently stalked the narrow stage, whipping the microphone cable into the air in between vocal lines and engaging the small audience. And I was on fire. My nerves melted away by the second song of our eight-song set. My guitar felt like it was playing itself and I was just along for the ride. It was a magical feeling, one that I still experience when everything flows without much effort. Bear was impressed with what he saw. He immediately offered us more shows on much better nights. One Friday night, a couple of months later, we opened for a traveling band from Florida called Last Child. Bear had grown to trust that we wouldn't try to drink alcohol or do anything stupid to get him in trouble, so we got there early and casually hung out with the Last Child guys. They were a few years older, but we hit it off. They told us about their life on the road, traveling from town to town in their van. They'd usually play Thursday through Sunday nights at a club and then move on to the next club in the next town and do the same thing. It all sounded like a dream to me. I couldn't imagine anything I'd want to do more. That night, not far from us in neighboring Norfolk, the Arizona-based thrash metal band Flotsam and Jetsam was playing at the Boathouse. I had a couple of their albums and was a fan. Whatever competition that show posed didn't hurt our turnout because on stage was packed. Chris introduced a song and dedicated it to Flotsam and Jetsam, boasting that we would have gone to their show, but we were playing our own instead. We launched into our version of Flotsam and Jetsam's cover of Elton John's Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting. The Last Child guys watched our whole set and complimented us when we finished. We stayed after and watched their set. They were phenomenal. I thought for sure they were on their way to being the next Skid Row, but I never heard anything more about them. That summer, we played a few more shows around the area, including a brutal weekend of woefully unattended shows at the Crystal Inn in Newport News. But a familiar sense of doom was creeping into our band. I had been accepted to Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond. It was the only college I'd applied to, and I wasn't particularly confident that I'd get in. I wasn't sure that I even wanted to go to college, but one thing was certain. I would have done just about anything to get out of Williamsburg and college was a fast ticket out. Toward the end of that summer, Chris stunned all of us by enlisting in the Marines. His plan was to defer for a year and start boot camp shortly after graduating from Lafayette High. With that, Killing Cycle's fate was sealed. We played a few more parties and even popped up at the Stockwood competition the following year. We won this time, but the dream we'd shared was dying. It had been the greatest thing I'd ever experienced and I had no idea how I could ever match it. At the end of August 1990, my parents and I made the hour-long trip up I-64 to Richmond. I moved into my shared room on the fifth floor of VCU's Johnson Hall and prepared to start my freshman year of college.